chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'm asking the question this morning, who you gonna believe? Who you gonna believe? Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13, if we stand in honor of the reading of God's word, and the word of the Lord reads, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. Would you bow with me? Master, we thank you, God, for your word. We ask right now, Lord, that you would just add your anointing, Lord, to the service, add the uh, anointing to your messenger. Help me, God, to deliver the word that you placed upon my heart at this time, that every soul might be blessed and encouraged, God, that would hear it, whether they be here in this room, Lord, or whether they be uh, somewhere outside waiting to hear by tape or by uh, the Internet. Master, just let it be a great blessing, a help, and an encouragement to each and every soul, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated today. You know, it's, it's interesting because usually when I use this text, as with many preachers, the primary focus of what you would be preaching on is going to be the deity of Jesus Christ and the identity of Jesus Christ and how that Peter recognized it and he acknowledged it and he was rewarded by the Lord for this. But actually, that's not the angle that I'm coming from this morning. I'm coming at this from a different perspective today. I'm coming at this today from the perspective of in response to Peter's uh, declaration of the Lord's identity, the Lord responds to him and says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. The Lord was saying that Peter was going to be a substance that he could build his church on. He was saying that Peter was of such a character and of such a uh, quality that God would be able to use him as a foundation stone in the very church of Jesus Christ. And yet we all know Peter's reputation wasn't real good. Peter didn't have the best reputation in the world. Peter didn't always do the right thing. And you know, I wonder sometimes people live their lives as though they don't believe what God has said to them. They don't believe what God has promised them. They don't believe what God has told them, just like the Lord told Peter this day, that he was a rock. Now you see, really, in the, in the uh, Greek, the name Peter comes from a word which literally translates a pebble or a small stone. So when the Lord made this uh, declaration, he was changing the he was changing the way in which Peter wants to perceive himself. You know, when you come to the Lord and you become a child of God. You ought to have a different perspective on how you look at yourself. Am I telling the truth? Amen. You shouldn't let the devil walk all over you. You shouldn't let the enemy trample all over you because you're a child of God and you don't have to let the devil trample on you. Amen. And you ought to have a changed perspective because whereas you might have been a pebble yesterday, you're a stone today. Amen. You're a rock today that's able to serve in the foundation of God's church. 
And when God has promised us things and God has spoken to us things, my friend, I want you to know it's important for us to believe Him because God don't tell fear. Amen. The Lord doesn't lie. If He says it, He means it. If He means it, He says it. Makes me think of if you've ever seen a on television nowadays, they get all kind of these shows, you know, about relationships and all that, right? You ever see some of these lovers quarrel where maybe a member of the family or a friend or somebody comes to a young lady and says, I tell your boyfriend, he was cheating on you. I've seen him over at this place with this woman, you know. And all of a sudden your girlfriend goes to her boyfriend and says, my sister Susie says she's seen you cheating on me. She's seen you over there at this place with this girl and one of them. And the first line come out of the guy's mouth is, Girl, I wasn't doing nothing. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? What's he saying? He said, Well, because I've said different than what she said, you now have an option. You can either believe what they said, or you can believe what I said, right? Isn't that what he's saying? He said, who are you going to believe? You going to believe your own sister? You going to believe your best friend? You going to believe your mother? Or you going to believe me? Because the implication is, if you love me so much, and if we're a couple and you love me so much, then obviously you're going to believe me, right? That's what he's hoping for anyway, is that you know, you're automatically going to lean toward believing him, because after all, if you love me so much, then, then if I deny it, then you're going to believe me. And today the question that I'm asking the church is, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what your mommy and your daddy told you growing up? Are you going to believe what the world out there tells you? Are you going to believe what society has to say? Or are you going to believe God for your life? Amen. Who are you going to believe? I got news for you today. Our love is measured in terms of who we believe and how readily we believe them. Think about this for a minute. Our love is measured by, in terms of who we believe and how readily we believe them. Just like that little lover's quarrel. If you really love somebody, Troy, you're going to believe them when they tell you something, aren't you? When you really love somebody, you're going to believe them when they tell you something. You're not just going to get up and leave them and walk out on them because somebody else said, well, I saw her with somebody else, or I saw him with somebody else, or I saw this, or I saw that. No, you're not going to do that. Not if you really love the person that you're with. Well, I got news for you. There's a lot of people in this world running around calling themselves Christians and say, I love the Lord. Oh, I just love the Lord. But they don't believe nothing he said. Am I telling the truth now? <laughs> they don't believe nothing that he said. They say, well, I love God. I love the Lord so much. Yeah, then why don't you believe nothing that he said? How come you let advertising on television to, uh, determine your self-worth and, and determine how you feel about yourself rather than letting what God has to say. The Bible says you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. So why then, if you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, why would you let uh, television advertising and society make you feel like you're something ugly and unattractive and unappealing? But see, we do that, don't we? My Bible said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And yet, <laughs> there are a lot of believers who allow themselves to be sidetracked, if not even stop dead in their tracks. And they don't get done what they're trying to do, and they can't do what they're trying to do. Why? Because they don't believe God. Mm. How many times you meet people in the streets and you're trying to do something and it might be a little difficult, might be a little bit hard. I'm trying to go to school and I'm trying to finish my education or I'm trying to work two jobs or I'm trying to do this. So, you know, there's a lot of 
situations in life. I'm trying to get this done. I'm trying to get that done. And the first words out of somebody's mouth would be, oh, that's, oh, that's too hard to be doing. I, I can't do that. Lord, no, I, I wouldn't want to have to be trying to do that. Haven't you met people like that? You tell them what you're trying to do, and the first thing they talk about is how they could never do it. But you know what? When you love somebody, you believe them. When you love somebody, you're more inclined to believe what they have to say. And my Bible said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And I love the Lord, and if he said it, I believe he meant it. And if he meant it, I believe I can do it. And I'm not going to worry about what the world has to say. I'm not going to worry about what my friends have to say. I'm not going to worry about what acquaintances or family have to say. There are many people in our society, myself included, who grew up with parents that, especially, of course, my dad, that never had anything positive to say about his kids. All I ever heard was, you'll never amount to nothing. You'll never achieve anything. You'll never have anything. You'll never have it. You'll never this. You'll never that. You'll never this. But you know what? I made up my mind a long time ago, Troy. I'm not going to believe my dad. I'm going to believe my father. Amen? I'm not going to believe my dad. I'm going to believe God. I love the Lord. Jesus said, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. I love the Lord more than I love my earthly father. And I'll tell you what, uh, what, my, what my heavenly father has to say is a whole lot more constructive. It's a whole lot more positive. It's a whole lot more helpful to me in my life than anything my earthly father ever said. So, Donna, who am I going to believe? I'm going to believe God. You betcha. I'm going to believe God. Because our love is measured by who we believe and how willingly we believe them. If you love God, you're going to believe God. Listen, in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, the Word of God declares, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Our love is measured in terms of who we believe and how readily we believe them. John said, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. In other words, Booby, don't believe the world. Don't believe the things that are in the world. Don't believe, don't let them tell you, don't let them dictate to you about your life. You let God do the dictating because he's going to tell you the truth. He's going to steer you in the right direction. And he loves you and everything he says is motivated in love and based in love. And that's not true of the world. But if our love is measured by, in terms of who we believe and how readily we believe them, then it's imperative that we love not the world. Don't let the world be your first love, because if the world is your first love, then you're going to be inclined to believe what the world has to say. You hear me now? Don't let your parents be your first love. I can't let my daddy be my first love. My brother Michael is constantly living his life trying to somehow please my father and trying to win my father's approval and trying to win my father's affection. But you know what? You can't let daddy be your first love. Because if you let daddy be your first love, then what daddy says, you'll be more likely to believe. Because whom you love the most is whom you believe. You're following my logic this morning. I want you to know also today that what we believe today, listen to this, this is good. What we believe today 
is what we become tomorrow. What we believe today is what we become tomorrow. Most parents get this principle backwards. They fill their kids' minds with negative and defeating words like, you're never going to amount to anything or you will never have anything in life. And unwittingly, by speaking such words in the hearing of their children, they are assuring that their child's future will indeed be just exactly what they have prophesied. When you take a child, a young person, and you keep speaking all that negativity and all that, you know, horrible negative down junk in their hearing, guess what? All you're doing is guaranteeing that exactly what you're saying is what's going to come to pass. See, parents don't realize, you've heard me say it many times, God is the perfect practitioner of positive reinforcement. The Lord doesn't run around telling you what you're never going to do, what you're never going to be. No, the Lord turns around, and even when you go off in the wrong, and you're not in the right direction, and you're going the wrong way, the Lord is on the sideline saying, don't worry, Troy, you'll get it right one day, boy. Yeah. Amen. Don't worry, Tommy, one of these days you're going to get it right. Just get up if you fall, because somewhere along the line you're going to get it right. Because God is the, is the perfect practitioner of positive reinforcement. He doesn't fill our minds with all that negativity. He doesn't fill our minds with all those weights of negativity that uh, cause us to become the very things that have been spoken. Because what we are made to believe today is what we will become tomorrow. And if we're made to believe we're a failure, and we're a flop, and we're no good and we're never going to be and blah blah blah. If we're made to believe that, then that's exactly what's going to wind up happening. That's why it's so important that we believe the one that we love. And that's why it's so important that we love the one who needs to be loved first, and that is the Lord. Amen? Because if we believe, if we love the Lord first, if he's our first love in our life, then he'll be the one we believe before anybody else. And when the rest of the world is saying, you'll never get out of that hole you're in, you'll never get that situation resolved, you'll never get that thing fixed, you'll never be anything, you'll never do this, you'll never do that, God is up there saying, oh, you'll get out of it, you just keep going. You'll watch. On the other side of that little hill over there is the sunrise. So don't quit, because you're not too far from victory. Don't quit. You're not too far from getting over this dilemma. The Bible declares in Proverbs 18 and verse 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. See, a lot of, especially parents, a lot of parents make the mistake they don't realize Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can kill a kid with your mouth. You can destroy a life with your mouth. I've seen relationships between husbands and wives and partners and everything else where one partner completely annihilated the other one. Exactly. How? With their mouth. Because death and life were in the power of the tongue. Honey, all they had to do was begin to tear down their partner enough to make them believe, and that's the key, to make you believe it. See, Donna, it don't really affect you until you believe it. Amen. Troy could say every nasty thing to you under the sun, and as long as you believe different, you're going to be all right. Am I right? You can be with somebody for 20 years and they can say all kind of nasty. My grandmother and my grandfather were together for 52 and a half years when he died. And my grandfather was a hard man, very hard man. He didn't talk in nice terms at all. He tended to be very plain spoken and cussed a lot and 
kind of nasty sounding, you know. And he used to say things to my grandmother, boy, I'll tell you what, just say some nasty things to her. She's heavy, she's very overweight. And he'd just say a lot of nasty things to her. But you know what? My grandmother knew I'm a child of God. The Lord loves me. That's all that matters. So you can say what you want to say because I know who I am in Christ Jesus. So for all the negativity that Grandpa had to say, it really didn't affect her too much because she didn't believe it all. Amen? And I want you to know today, the world can say what it wants to say about you. Society can say what it wants to say about you. The community can say what it wants to say about you. It's not a problem for you until you start to believe it. So the question is, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe society? You're going to believe your parents? You're going to believe the community? You're going to believe the world? You're going to believe television? You're going to believe advertising? Or are you going to believe God? I don't believe God. I'll tell you that much right now. Peter, the one that we're speaking of in our primary text this morning, had many experiences during the course of his walk with the Lord, which might have suggested that he was anything but a rock upon which the church of Christ would later be built. Peter had a lot of experiences in his life and during the course of his walk with the Lord. He had a lot of experiences, Troy, that said, this guy is, he's anything but a rock. You remember that little game you used to play as a kid, rock, paper, scissors? He said, I may be paper and I may be scissors, but I'm hardly a rock. Because a rock implies strength. A rock implies stability. A rock implies that you're unmovable, that once you get yourself established, it then the devil in hell going to move you. But Peter didn't have that kind of a reputation. And yet the Lord still said, you're a rock I can build on. Who are you going to believe, Peter? Are you going to believe Jesus or are you going to believe your past experiences? In Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33, we read the story of how Peter is on the boat as the Lord is seen outside walking on the water. And he asked the Lord, Lord, call me out on the water and I can walk on the water with you. And the Lord said, all right, Peter, come. And here comes Peter. All of a sudden, Peter gets to look around. And he realizes, good God, I'm doing something that ain't natural. I'm doing something I shouldn't be able to do. And he begins to sink. And the Lord reaches down and grabs him by the arm and picks him back up. And they get on the boat, but listen to this. Jesus rebukes him for his lack of faith. Ooh, that doesn't sound like much of a rock to me. Amen. That doesn't sound like much of a rock to me. But in spite of the fact that Peter had this experience with Jesus, in spite of the fact that Peter had this obvious uh, moment of unbelief, the Lord still said, and your name is Peter, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church. Who are you going to believe? In Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23, we read how that the Lord was telling the disciples that he was soon to be executed and that he would soon die. And Peter began to jump in there thinking he was so sweet. Oh, Lord, no, we don't want that to happen to you. God forbid. Well, no, Lord, we don't want that to happen. And the Lord turns around and rebukes him. Boy, Peter, for a rock, you sure are getting rebuked a lot. <laughs> and the Lord rebukes him for worldly thinking. He said, no, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. That was his exact verse. Get me behind, get thee behind me, Satan. He said, For thou desirest the things of man and not the things of God. 
He said, you cannot look at things in terms of the way man looks at things. you got to look at things the way God looks at things. You're looking at the crucifixion as though it's the greatest defeat that I'll ever experience. And I'm telling you, the crucifixion is the greatest victory that I'll ever experience. But you've got to love God to be able to face a crucifixion and believe that it's going to be your greatest victory and not your greatest defeat. You've got to love God awful lot to be able to face it and experience so negative and so painful and so trying as that. you got to love God an awful lot. But see, the Lord was able to do that because he believed God before he believed anybody. It didn't matter to him if the world thought that they were getting rid of a pain in the neck and they were getting somebody out of the picture that they, he knew better. He said three days from now this old pain in the neck will come back and sting you like a bee and I'm going to be the worst thing you ever saw because I'm going to wind up building up a church that's going to last for millennium. And they'll be speaking my name and singing my name and preaching my name all over the place, all over the world. Y'all thought crucifying me was going to be your greatest hour of victory that I'm going to lose for you. It's going to be the greatest mistake you ever made. But see, if you love God, you're able. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus was able, because he loved the Lord, he believed God. He believed that spirit that was within him that said, trust me, everything is going to be all right. Can you trust God today? Can you believe the Lord today when he says, trust me, everything's going to be all right? Can you trust him? Lord, I love you, but I don't want to just say I love you. I want to really love you. And because I really love you, I believe what you tell me. Are you following my logic today? I want you to understand this message because this is an important message. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46, we read of Peter being with the Lord at Gethsemane. And the Lord asks Peter and James and John to pray with him for a while. But rather than pray, Peter went to sleep. When the Lord came back from having stepped off a little bit further to a private place, he found Peter and the others sleeping. And here Peter is rebuked for his inability to watch and pray. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but so far I've given you three examples of circumstances and situations in Peter's life, and ain't a one of them he sounded like a rock to me. Ain't a one of them he sounded like. If he's a rock, he's a rock that rolls. Because he sure enough don't sound like a rock to me. He sounds like a little tiny pebble that just blows in the wind is what he sounds like. But you see, this is why it's imperative to believe what God says. You can't even trust your own personal experience. You've got to trust the Lord. In Matthew 26, 69 through 75, we read how that Peter denies the Lord three times. Not once, not twice, three times, Donna, he denied the Lord. Three times he denied the Lord. That doesn't sound like a rock to me. <laughs> He doesn't sound like somebody who's steadfast, unmovable. He doesn't sound like somebody who's got conviction. He doesn't sound like somebody who's not going to change his mind for nobody, no way. That's what a rock implies. But he don't sound like a rock to me. He sounds like a sheet in the wind that's being blown with every wind and wave that comes along. But honey, in spite of the fact that in his lifetime, Peter was 
rebuked by the Lord for lack of faith. In spite of the fact that Peter was rebuked by the Lord for worldly thinking. In spite of the fact that Peter was rebuked for his inability to watch and pray. In spite of the fact that Peter denied the Lord three times. When the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, I want you to know Peter finally became the rock that the Lord had said he would be. And I want you to know today, just because you have not fully realized your full potential, and just because you are not today everything that God wants for you to be, you get there. You will get there. Don't you let the devil tell you any different. Don't you let the world tell you any different. Don't you let your parents tell you any different. Don't you let television tell you any different. Don't you let society tell you any different. Because if God said it, it is so. So long as you'll believe it. It's only so if you believe it. And I tell the truth today. Amen. Too many believe what their parents have said or what the world has to say about them. Forgetting all about the fact that the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, has personally said, that we are his unique and perfect possession. Who are you going to believe today? The world? Your family? Your parents? Your employers? Society? Or are you going to believe God? I don't know about you. I made up my mind. I'm going to believe God. Amen. <laughs> People say, Brother Moore, I don't know how you keep going with as much struggle as you've had in your ministry over the last 12 years. You know how I keep going, Troy? Because I believe God. And I believe that even though today we may not be where we want to be as a church, we're going to get there. But we ain't going to get there if I quit today. So I've got to keep going. Because I believe God. Amen. And when you love somebody, you tend to believe what they tell you. And I love the Lord. And I believe what he's told me. And I'm just, I know, I don't know when it's going to come, but it's going to come. So I'm just going to hold out to the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Would you stand with me? Nice, simple, fairly succinct message today, huh? Amen. Master, we love you so much. We thank you, God, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for this place, for each and every individual that's made the, the effort today to be in the house of God. We just ask, Lord, that you would add blessing upon blessing upon blessing to each and every life in this room. God, there are so many needs represented in this place today. Many prayer requests today, Lord, that were not taken, but you know the need. The Word of God declares you know what we have need of before we even ask it. And Master, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come against the devourer. And Lord, everything that would try to come against the finances of God's people, everything, God, that would try to come against uh, our ability to provide for ourselves and do what we need to do. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I find the enemy. Lord, I claim victory and I claim liberty. In the name of the Lord, devil, you're a liar and the father of lies. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we set you in flight. You have no place here. You have no place in the life of a child of God. Our, uh, our God has declared that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And today, every enemy is set in flight in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Glory to God. And we claim liberty, Master, in Jesus' name. And we're believing you, God, to open doors where doors did not even appear to be open. We're believing you, God, to move in the areas of finances. We're believing you, God, to move in miraculous ways, to do miraculous things. For Jesus today, you're our God and we trust you. And we love you and we know, Lord, that you're capable of doing what no man can do. Oh, God, open these doors and do for we rely upon you so heavily this hour. Help us to love you more, God, that we might believe you when you speak. And Lord, whatever today's circumstance might be, help us to believe your promise. Help us to embrace your hope. Help us, God, to look forward 
to the vision that you have given us for our lives. Master, grant it, we pray this day, so we ask it in none other than the lovely name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. God bless you in Jesus' name today. You're dismissed. Go in peace.